question this morning. What are the first three fruits of the Holy Spirit? Anybody? Love, joy, and peace. I don't know who planned it, but if you think of the sermons that have come this year, they've been interesting. The first one was Pastor Leo, and it was a baptism of Tilly and Fonts, and there was a lot of joy and a lot of love. And then the next week, we had Stuart preach. What did he preach on? We hear some good sermons, but we forget them. He talked about Dr. Christian Barnard, who performed the first human heart transplant. And he went to talk about what we don't often realise is our need of a heart transplant. And so he, he was highlighting that we need God to do some work inside us. And it's really hard work. Last week we talked a little, little bit about uh, the assurance of salvation and what that means. But today I want you to contemplate uh, a little bit further on the same theme of love and joy and peace. And then there are other fruits. What are the next ones? Now, as we think of them, there's quite a few. We'll talk about one or two of those at the end of the service. But I want to uh, suggest today that as we think about the service, I didn't know what sin was when I was a little boy and I had my foot cut wide open. And it left a scar. And it took me a long time to understand what scars do to you and the wounds we have. And sometimes how our image of God the Father is uh, distorted because of the wounds and scars that we carry. And we need to address them. But... Uh, my title today is Love Who? Last week we raised a question of, uh, uh, of uh, Augustine who said, love God and do as you please. And my question was, is that true or false? Now I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand and I'm not even going to answer the question for you but I want you to think about it as we work through today's message and think about what it really means. The passage which I want to refer to today is just one chapter and a little bit preceding it. It's the beginning of the series in Luke in which he tells a whole lot of stories that Jesus told and wonderful stories they are. And we used the story last week of whom? Prodigal son. The prodigal son? Or the father? That's the question. Is it really about the boys or is it about the father? And the father's love. And how did he treat his sons? And the undying, relentless love he had for them, which mirrored in many ways the father's love for us. I want to share with you today the uh, setting and then the story and then the solution of what Jesus is dealing with in these passages that are reflected for us in Luke. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51 through to 56, it tells about Jesus setting his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. And that meant he had to cross over the River Jordan from Perea, where he was on the east, and go up through Samaria. And on the way... He was not given hospitality by the Samaritans. You remember the story? And, and so he moved on. But James and John came to him and they said, look, we should call fire down on them. They have uh, rebuked you and they deserve to be treated according to their action. And Jesus said, oh no, no, we're not going to do that. And he rebuked his disciples and then he moved on. Keep that in mind because that's an important thing that comes a little bit later. If we move to the next couple of verses, it tells how there was an urgency in the, in the kingdom, an urgency to 
send out messages, an urgency not to be waylaid when we follow Jesus. There was a man who said, I want to go home and say goodbye to my family. And another man who had other things to do, excuses that slowed them down in following. And so urgency is the real setting that uh, this occurs in. And now we come to the the, uh, real beginning of the setting. Luke chapter 10 and verses 1 to 16. This is dealing with the sending out of the 72. If you think of 72, they went out in pairs, two by two, which left 36 pairs. What does 36 represent? Three in the, in the Bible is a trinity number, isn't it? It's about the Godhead. And 12 is about what? What does 12 represent? The kingdom. And so his message was to them, when you go out, if they welcome you, then you give them your blessing and say the kingdom of God is not near. Sorry, the kingdom of God is near. But if they don't welcome you, then shake the dust off your feet, but remind them the same message, the kingdom of God is near. Where was the kingdom near? In what way? The kingdom was now becoming present in the person of Jesus. And that was what he wanted them to see. And so, welcome or not, the message of the kingdom of God is near. And uh, as they went out in the following verses, they came back with great joy. Joy because of what they had been given in power that even the demons were subject to them. And Jesus said, that's okay, but don't rejoice in that. Rejoice why? Why should you rejoice? He said, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Why are we rejoicing today? Why are we full of love and joy? Because we have peace with God and our names are written in heaven. Romans 5 says, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And when we see that real peace of knowing everything is all right with our Father and that our names are written in heaven, are you sure about that? Do you know you're saved? That was the question last week, wasn't it? And so, as we think of the assurance of salvation that Jesus brings us, what we needed to do is simply repent and turn toward God. Where do we see God? Where do we see him most clearly? The next verses say, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus, and he's got the joy of the Holy Spirit and he said I pray you Father Lord of heaven and earth because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children yes Father for this is what you were pleased to do when you think of children what do we take away from his statement there what is there about children is it their age no It's about their dependent relationship. Kids need a mum and dad, don't they? And they look up to them. They need your leadership. They need your love. They need your care. And in a dependent relationship, when we are simply looking to our Father and his love, his care, his protection, then we'll be full of joy too. In the next few verses... Uh, Sorry, the next verse, it says, uh, we've skipped a couple of verses, so I'll have to go back and do it from memory. Take your Bible. I'm going to get you to have a look at it and make you work a little bit this morning. Luke chapter 10. You don't have to jump from passage to passage in this message. It's all here together. And in Luke chapter 10, we've got verse 21. 
But then it says in verse uh, 23 and 24, all things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So how do we know the Father? It's what we see in Jesus and what he reveals to us that tells us about the Father. And then it says he turned to his disciples and said privately, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but didn't see it, and to hear what you hear, but didn't hear. They all spoke about Messiah, but they never actually saw him in the flesh. How blessed were those disciples who saw him. And so, as we think of living with Jesus, looking to Jesus, seeing in him the Father, it went on to say on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. He was a lawyer. Why was he testing Jesus? because the Pharisees and the scribes and the leaders of Israel had set him up to it. But in this man's heart, he knew the duplicity of those leaders. He questioned their motives. And so when he asked the question, he asked a question that came from his own heart, his own mind. Teacher, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life, to have eternal life. Jesus didn't give him a quick answer. He asked him to think. And when we read the Bible, we need to think. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. What is written in the law? What Moses said, Jesus replied, how do you read it? What do you think? And so he answered, Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbour as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. And now he came to a point where he realised that Jesus was saying, are you really doing this? And so, not having chosen the sort of question that the Pharisees might have chosen because they debated that very frequently, his own honest question brought him to a conviction. I need to love God and love my neighbour. And he didn't quite like that because you see the question of who was your neighbour was debated regularly. And all they were thinking about is those who are in our church those who are in Israel, not the Samaritans, not those guys. Where did Samaritans come from? They were part of Moses' descendants and they loved the Lord and they loved the Pentateuch. And so they were followers of Moses and the Pentateuch. But when it came to the carrying of the ark in the tent which was so precious from Moses' day on as it led Israel they set up a place of worship at Shiloh and one of the priests took a copy of the Pentateuch and he hid it in a cave and after that there was a dispute where should it really be? Where should we worship? And so they worshipped at Mount Gerizim and the Jews worshipped at Jerusalem. Jesus has set his face to go to Jerusalem. And so were they to go up to Jerusalem? Or was the Messiah right there with them? The living Messiah, the reflection of God. And so he asked the question to get out of this a little bit. Who is my neighbour? He replied, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. 
he was one who'd come to worship at Jerusalem and was going back down. He was a Jew. He got as far as Jericho. And when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And so here he is lying on the ground, bleeding, half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Priests weren't interested in caring for the down and out. They kept away from those who had been unfortunately cursed by God. They were pure and holy. And so to protect himself from contamination, he walked by on the other side. Along came a Levite. A Levite came to the place and saw him. How did he see him? Well, he went and looked. He got close enough to see what was going on. But he still still decided this was not his responsibility. Now, when we read the Pentateuch, we'll find that priests had a responsibility to the poor and oppressed, the bound, the blind, the bruised, the wounded. And if they dishonoured the poor, they were dishonouring God. But he passed by. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity. The Samaritan was whom? He was an enemy. Not just different, but they regarded them as enemies. But he took pity on him. And as a result, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, which is about two full day's wages, and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense he may have. And so he cared for all the man's needs, not just his physical needs, his material needs, the money he would need for his care. And as we continue on, Jesus asks the question now, which of these three do you think was neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, the one who had pity, And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. As we reflect on this, Jesus is about to tell us something important. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What does reconciliation mean? Is it getting along with our family, with our friends, with our neighbours, with our church people? Or is it wider than that? Is it getting along with our enemies? That was the difficult task, and the difficult task for you and me, I think, the most difficult thing. And so as we move along, the love of God in the heart is the only spring toward our neighbour. Who said that? Did I say that? I have to be honest and say I have to quote people. And so one of my favourite authors, out of a favourite book of mine, Desire of Ages, said it. And on page 505, this is what it says. The love of God in the heart is the only spring of love toward our neighbour. What do you and I need? We need the love of Jesus, love of Jesus down in our... Where? Heart. That's it. Because that will be our motivation. It was heart work with Christ. Page 668. It was hard work with Christ. What did that mean? Jesus had to spend 
time with his father in a close and growing relationship if he was to be successful in his work and maintain his love for those who honestly were a pain in the neck. Jesus loved his disciples even though he didn't like everything they did. It's a bit like a marriage. Do you like everything your marriage partner does? Some people are going to shake their head at that. But we love them, not because of what they do, but because love comes out of us. And that love is implanted in us with a new heart by God. So we can love even our enemies. We don't have to like them. We don't have to honour everything they do, but we should be motivated by love toward them because that's the only spring of right work. And it was heart work with Christ, Ellen White says. All true obedience comes from the heart. And so she goes on to say, and if we consent, all we have to do is agree, he will. Who's the he? God will. God will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Was Augustine right when he said, love God and then do as you please? It depends on what presuppositions you bring to the statement. What assumptions? And sometimes we're reading authors of a different faith, we think they've got to be wrong. Maybe sometimes they're right. And I'll leave you to work out whether Augustine was right or wrong. But it all has to do with love in our hearts planted there by God. And so when we know God as it is our privilege to know him, what did Pastor Lee Vennard talk about? He said, it's not what you know, but who you know. When we know him, when we love him as it's our privilege to do, our life will be a life of continual obedience. And so you can see that loving God and obedience are not at six and sevens with each other. They're not oppositional. They flow together one after the other and our will becomes conformed to the will of God. When, we, when that happens, what joy it brings. And so she says once more, unless there is practical self-sacrifice for the good of others, in the family circle, in the neighbourhood, in the church, and wherever we may be, whatever our professions, oh, we are not Christians. Does that make you feel a little bit guilty sometimes? I think sometimes I feel guilty and I have to know what to do with that. Is that guilt good or bad? And when I feel I'm not living up to what I really need to do. But you know, the practical application of this sermon is what? If the solution is God's love in our hearts, to love even our enemies, then we need to do something about it. Who's your neighbour? Is it your spouse sitting next to you? Is it the friend beside or behind or in front of you? Yes, it is. And we need to show them love by our acts of self-service, our kindness, our gentleness, our goodness, our patience, our faithfulness, our self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit that follow from love and joy and peace. We can't just have joy in church. We've got to do something to share it. That's why he sent out people to say the kingdom is near. Is that not our message today? But we need to do more than just say it. 
We need to minister to their needs. The poor, the lonely, the homeless. We need to get out of our churching and into our communities. Two ladies from Kiribati came to a climate change conference, an international conference in Australia. And they were keen to tell of what it was like in their homeland, how they were being threatened with impeding, um, with encroaching seas that would take away their livelihood, perhaps their lives. And they were there for a political reason, to lobby the government to do something different. But when they met a fellow Seventh-day Adventist, because these two women were Seventh-day Adventists, they said, do you think we really should be doing this? This is political work. Does that fit with our faith? And the good journalist, himself a Seventh-day Adventist, said, absolutely. I am sometimes troubled by our failure to get involved with things that involve politics, not for a political reason, but to be a voice for the oppressed, to be a voice for the poor, to be a voice for the lonely and homeless. The prophets who said what things would be did not assume that it was inevitably to be so. But if when people heard their message, they turned to the Lord and changed, there would be a different outcome. You and I need to envisage a better world, a better world around us. And people need to see in us that the kingdom of God is near. So maybe I feel a bit guilty when I think about that. And maybe you feel you're not quite doing as much as you could also. What will we do with that? That sometimes is guilt we have to deal with. And so for my next sermon, hey, you're going to have to put up with me a third time. <laughs> Not until March the 16th. The pastor said, would I preach on the week before? And I said, it's a long weekend. Look at how many people are not here with their kids. But I said, I'll do it on the 16th. So, love, judgment and glory, how do they fit together? I want you to think about that. Judgment frightens me a little bit. That's the way I was brought up in the church. That was the legacy I was left with. The Seventh-day Adventist teaching does it make us do things because we feel guilty. Remember the love of God in our hearts is the only spring of love for others. It's 12 o'clock. Will you sing with me? Oh, by the way, the last, chap last passages in chapter 10 tell a different story. What were they about? Martha, who was busy with all the details of serving, and Mary, who was doing what? Focusing on Jesus. Which of the two sisters had the greater impact in the world? Do we hear much about Martha later? What do we hear about Mary? Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached, this story will be told about what she has done for me. The impact of, Martha's, of Mary's life was far greater than she could ever imagine. And even today, it's having its influence. She gave a year's wages, not counting the cost, but uns unselfishly anointing Jesus for his burial because she loved him. I reckon that's the end of the chapter. Think about it and feel where love and justice come together and how that will lead us to glory.